Hello and welcome to Bedtime Stories with me, R.A. Spratt. Well, today's story is a Nanny Piggins one and it's from Nanny Piggins and the Pursuit of Justice, or as I like to think of it, book six. So I'm going to read to you chapter four, which is called Madam Piggins and the Psychic Gift. Here we go. Nanny Piggins had never been so bored in her life. When she agreed to chaperone the children's school excursion as part of her community service, she had assumed they'd be going somewhere interesting, like a scorpion farm, or a hot air balloon race, or at the very least, to a cake factory. But no, Headmaster Pimplestock had organised it, so they were traipsing around the National Transport Museum. To Nanny Piggins' way of thinking, museums were boring at the best of times, but to have an entire museum that only featured different forms of transport was too boring to be true. If she had to look at another train or bus while the curator droned on and on about kilowatts and talk, she was sure she would slip into a coma. The worst part was that the museum was supposed to be about transport, but there was not a single room devoted to the history of the flying pig. Her own life story would have been a thousand times more interesting than Adrian Cricklestein's, the inventor of the cog, and he had a whole display. On top of that, the children were being forced to fill out a ridiculous questionnaire written by Headmaster Pimplestock to prove that they had listened to every word the curator said, which totally prevented them from ignoring the curator and nipping off to the coffee shop for a few slices of cheesecake with their nanny. So Nanny Piggins was standing there in a room full of antique Victorian water pumps, trying to keep herself awake by thinking up new recipes for chocolate ice cream, perhaps more chocolate, when something caught her eye. Through a doorway at the far end of the room, she caught a glimpse of something red and shiny. Without thinking, her trotters were drawn towards it. Where are you going? whispered Samantha as her nanny began to where are you going? whispered Samantha as her nanny began to wander away. As far away from that dreadful curator as possible, said Nanny Piggins. Then I'm coming too, said Michael, dumping his questionnaire in a bin. Derek followed, reasoning that he was the oldest, so it would be irresponsible to let his little brother get in trouble all alone. And Samantha chased after them because, much as she did not want to get in trouble, she did not like being the one left behind to answer the angry and difficult questions. So Nanny Piggins and the children left the dreary Victorian water pump room and entered a huge airy pavilion with a high glass ceiling so they could see the sunshine and blue sky above. But that was not the best thing about the room. The best thing was that it was chock full of dozens and dozens of aeroplanes. There were modern jets, old propeller planes and funny looking water planes. Some hung from the ceiling, some stood up on pedestals, and some were parked on the ground. But the brightest and shiniest of all was the one Nanny Piggins had spotted first. It was a bright red World War I triplane with German insignia, so it was much, much more exciting than a Victorian water pump. What a pretty machine, said Nanny Piggins. What is it? It's a German fighter plane from the First World War, explained Derek. He'd been forced to study World War I only the previous term. That's a plane, exclaimed Nanny Piggins. I don't believe it. Where does everybody sit? Well, the pilot sits there and the passenger sits there, said Derek, pointing to the two openings in the chassis. But where does the stewardess sit? And how does she get the drinks cart up and down, asked Nanny Piggins, totally baffled. I don't think they had drinks carts on World War I fighter planes, said Samantha. No drinks cart, exclaimed the horrified Nanny Piggins. Next you'll be telling me they didn't serve an in-flight meal. <laughs> Sorry, we were interrupted by thunder there. I'm going to continue. Hopefully that's the last of it. No drinks cart, exclaimed the horrified Nanny Piggins. Next you'll be telling me they didn't serve an in-flight meal. Well, began Samantha. No in-flight meal? <gasps> gasped Nanny Piggins. No wonder they were at war. They must have been so unhappy. Nanny Piggins leaned her trotter on the wing of the plane, then immediately recoiled. 
This isn't a real plane. It's a forgery, cried Nanny Piggins. It is, said Michael, totally delighted. He enjoyed it when his nanny started denouncing people. And if she discovered a forgery, it was sure to lead to a lot of denouncing. Listen, continued Nanny Piggins, rapping on the wing of the plane again. It's hollow, and I think it's made of canvas. Maybe planes were made of canvas back in the old days, suggested Samantha. Don't be ridiculous. What would happen if it rained, said Nanny Piggins. Samantha had the mental image of a plane all limp and floppy like a wet beach towel. No, someone must have stolen the real plane and replaced it with this canvas replica, said Nanny Piggins. Well, there's only one way we can find out for sure. Call the police and ask them to bring down a forensic team to carbon date the material, suggested Derek. No, turn it on and see if it flies, declared Nanny Piggins. Oh no, said Samantha, sitting down on the ground and taking out her lunch. Not so she could eat anything, but so she could use the brown paper bag to hyperventilate into. But that'll never work, protested Derek. Why not, asked Nanny Piggins, as she walked around the plane, kicking the chocks out from under the wheels. This is a museum, isn't it? They're supposed to have restored everything to perfect working condition. But would there be petrol in the engine, asked Michael. I don't see why not, said Nanny Piggins. When the Germans lost the war, I expect they had a lot more important things to think about than whether or not they'd siphoned all the petrol out of their planes. Anyway, we'll soon see. Nanny Piggins hopped into the pilot seat. Oh dear, moaned Samantha as she tucked her head between her knees, partly to avoid fainting and partly so she would not have to see her beloved Nanny come to harm. Oh look, said Nanny Piggins delightedly, the German flying ace who last used this plane left his goggles under the seat. How thoughtful of him. Nanny Piggins put on the goggles and revved the engine. It can't be fake. That engine sounds fine, said Derek. Oh, we won't know for sure until we take her up, said Nanny Piggins. Up where, asked Michael. Even he was beginning to worry, and generally he was the least inclined to worry of any boy you would care to meet. For a spin, said Nanny Piggins, with a joyous glint in her eye. The children had seen that glint before. Nanny Piggins always got it before she threw herself into one of her death-defying stunts, such as being fired out of a cannon, doing a backflip off the clothesline, or returning a library book two days late. Do you know how to fly an aeroplane? asked Derek. I am the world's greatest flying pig, Nanny Piggins reminded him. Yes, but the principles are rather different when you haven't been blasted out of a cannon, argued Derek. Pish, said Nanny Piggins. And with that, she opened the throttle, released the brake, and the plane started to roll forward. At this point, the security guard from the museum started running towards them. Now you might be wondering why he had not taken action sooner, such as when Nanny Piggins turned on the noisy diesel engine of their 95-year-old German triplane. But you have to understand that the security guard was a little deaf, and he had fallen asleep while lip-reading the curator's incredibly boring talk on Victorian water pumps taking place in the next room. But an elderly man with a heart condition was never going to run down Nanny Piggins in an aeroplane. She shot down the full length of the hall, which was perfectly safe because the museum was so boring there were no members of the public for her to crash into. And then, just as Samantha hid her face in her jumper because she didn't want to see her nanny slam into a brick wall, the plane took off. And as it lifted up into the air, the triplane transformed from a rickety old thing banging along the ground into an elegant flying machine soaring through the sky. Well, as much sky as there was inside the room. Luckily for Nanny Piggins, it was a huge room, so she could comfortably... <laughs> Luckily for Nanny Piggins, it was a huge room, so she could comfortably do loop-de-loops around and around. Stop that pig! screamed the curator as he ran into the pavilion. How? asked the befuddled security guard. Do I have to do everything myself? complained the curator. And with that, he leapt into a World War I British biplane, turned on the engine and took off after Nanny Piggins. Goodness knows what he thought he could do to get Nanny Piggins to come down. They may have left petrol in the engines, but the restoration team did have the sense to remove the bullets from the machine guns. So all the curator could do was chase Nanny Piggins around and around, which she rather enjoyed. She did loop the loops and barrel rolls and weaved in between all the planes hanging from the ceiling to confuse him. Then Nanny Piggins flew towards the sun so the curator would lose sight of her before reappearing behind him, blowing raspberries. Down on the ground, all the school children cheered. 
the most boring school excursion had turned into the world's most exciting school excursion in just a few short moments. Nanny Piggins eventually landed voluntarily when the plane ran out of petrol and started to sputter. She glided to a perfect landing, yanking on the handbrake and rolling the triplane to a halt in exactly the same position she had found it. Unfortunately, the curator was not such an adept pilot. When he tried to land, he came in too fast, skidded all the way along the floor, making a mess of the patina, and slamming into the refrigerated cake stand out the front of the cafeteria, totally ruining the New York cheesecake Nanny Piggins had her eye on for afternoon tea, which so horrified Nanny Piggins that she actually started to cry. Fortunately, licking bits of New York cheesecake off the sides of the smashed refrigerator cake stand soon cheered her up. Well, it started to rain, so I think we'll take a break there. 